Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. A lot of people don't realize that we have some wild parrots in Texas, including the red crowned parrot. The region itself is, is quite large and the drives can be a little bit long. To have a species be extinct and have a, a second chance to revive it is unheard of. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. I think that there's something about parrots that is special just in their gregarious nature. They're very interactive in a way that I think people connect with. Their kind of bodily movements, you know, the way they kind of turn their head. They're so interesting to just watch. You see a group hanging out, having fun, partying sort of. As a human, you see a lot of yourself in these parrots. In the very south of Texas, a team of wildlife sleuths has gathered to share information on one of the state's most mysterious wild birds. These are the parrot investigators. People in Dallas and Houston have no idea there are parrots down here, and a lot of people don't even know that many of these individuals are wild and wary and came here on their own. They're native. A lot of people don't realize that parrots are wild too and they do better in the wild, and we have some wild parrots in Texas, including the red crown parrot. Little is known about wild red crowns, but nature tracker Cullen Hanks is on the case. They line up on the telephone wires. I always see them in the houses in those neighborhoods. Yeah, one of the things that we do know is that they have adapted to live in cities in South Texas. Based on tips from eyewitnesses, Cullen is convinced to set up an old-fashioned stakeout. Teaming up with local biologist, Tony Panahan. This is right when they showed up last night. Okay. Every time I've had them, it's been a little darker. They're looking to get a few of the facts straight. When we started looking at it, nobody knew how many parrots are there in South Texas. But we know the general area where they come, where they aggregate at the end of the day. They're out there. Right. Over there. Yeah, over here. Once they spot the gang, the chase is on. It's very hard to follow them. You know, we're on foot as humans trying to keep up. Look at all of them. They're aloft flying, and they can cover so much more ground than we can. Wow, look at all those. That's, it's tricky to get them. Oh, here. It seems kind of simple. You know, they're the parrots. You count them one, two, three. But when you see them, it's just this raucous kind of movement of activity, and it's really difficult to actually count them. It's just impossible when they're flying around to get a precise number. Hopefully having multiple observers will help. We have one ornithologist, but we have so many more eyes on the ground when we engage many birders throughout the state. One of those eyes on the ground is Dr. Carl Berg. He's a bit of a surveillance expert. Most of my interest is concerned with acoustic communication. You know, what other pet can insult you in French and Spanish and <laughs> German, yeah, given the right training. He thinks he's found a clue. By analyzing the vocalizations they make, he's been able to ID their contact calls or code names. Parrots arguably have the most sophisticated, imitative vocal abilities of any non-humans, including all the primates, believe it or not. He's hoping to go deeper by bugging the homes of parrot families, like he once did with these Venezuelan parrots. To plant the mics, he needs a man on the inside. He turns to research assistant Caleb Arellano. I've been wanting to work with parrots for like the last six years. Finally being able to do so is like a dream come true. It's here at the southmost preserve that Caleb gets his supplies. So this is, uh, they have like three different piles of the PVC pipe on the preserve around here. So what we're doing is we're gonna be using this irrigation PVC pipe in order to make the nest boxes. This is a prototype one and it's a lot thicker 
and if you pick it up, it's a lot heavier. So we have the nest liners, and then we're gonna be cutting out like a section of the wire so that the birds can come in and they can use the wires to climb down and climb up. Red crown parrots like to nest in cavities, tree hollows. The red crown parrot's pretty particular. They don't like something that's too small or too big, kind of like Goldilocks, it has to be just right. The palm trees, which once forested this area, are now in short supply. In places where their turf hasn't already been taken over by farmland, humans often remove dead trees, seeing them as a hazard. Once installed, these nest boxes might give the birds the space they need to raise their young in a place where we can watch over them. Because a lack of homes is not the only problem, this may also be a case of kidnapping. You know, unlike a lot of other endangered species, they're not necessarily under pressure from the pet industry. Targeted by poachers looking to make a quick buck, red-crowned parrots are valuable on the black market. Often taken right out of the nest, baby parrots are sold in shady deals like this one, caught on video in an undercover sting operation. They're targeted for their speech. A talking bird is too good to resist for some people looking for a novelty pet. And all too often, the chicks end up in the wrong hand. They're losing a lot of individuals from people capturing them and selling them in flea markets and pet stores. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife is very interested in and has uh, recently uh, nominated it for a candidate for listing for possible threatened or endangered species status. So how do we know this could be on the way to extinction? Um, well, scientists put that together by, by looking at population sizes and how they change over time. And to do that, a search party is being gathered at the local Audubon Society. I'm really grateful that um, some of y'all are participating in the survey here in the Harlingen area. I think it's going to really help to have multiple observers. What I've been doing is just reaching out to different groups that might want to participate, some of which were already tracking parrots on their own, and trying to coordinate efforts so that we do this all at the same time. Okay, so this is the parrot that we are looking for. This is the red crown parrot. I was asked to help organize all the volunteers. Yes. We had four towns uh, that were cooperating in this study uh, in McAllen, Westlaco, Harlingen, and Brownsville. Okay. We might have a significant chunk of the global population of red crowned parrots right here in South Texas. We're coordinating this wide effort of citizen scientists to help us count these parrots. Teams of birders are combing the valley to uncover some of the mysteries about this talkative bird. You know, there's no rule that says they, they all have to come here. They could be going somewhere else. We all go to specific areas where we expect the birds to roost to see if they actually show up where we expect them to. So by doing it all at the same time, we can validate that they are individual birds. And with the greater understanding comes a respect for their wild nature. People just think that they belong in a cage and that they're a pet. So this roost survey is going to hopefully answer some questions. And the big one is, how many do we have? These parrot investigators are building a case to make sure the red crowned parrot always has a home here in Texas. feels like more often than not. The region itself is, is quite large and the drives can be a little bit long. Every day is different. A regional interpretive specialist oversees and supports interpretation in their region of state parks. There are six of us scattered throughout the state. Basically, we're just trying to find ways to effectively communicate the park's resources to our visitors so that our visitors 
will then become park stewards themselves. You have a lot of people who help us out. In Region 5 especially, we have 16 state parks, and we only have six full-time interpreters in the region. So that means that the bulk of the interpretive responsibilities at these sites fall onto the shoulders of park staff. And so a regional interpretive specialist tries to help bring all those people together to give the uh, park staff a voice. A little read to, you know, get the bigger picture of it. It really reinforces that they are that they can be interpreters as well, that they're already out there engaging our customers. This is, this is huge. I bust out in song when I'm driving, and it's really hard not to have a mini dance party. Get you, like, excited and awake and alert. We're really close with one another. <laughs> Despite the large distances that exist between all of us, and. Anytime we get the opportunity to get together and actually hang out and spend time with one another is just always a pure joy. Recently, we went on a trip to Devil's River where we had our regional interpretive specialist retreat and we received some high rain and there was a chance that we were gonna be stuck in the park. The maintenance ranger at Devil's, he said, oh yeah, this happens and in fact, we've been trapped for, you know, 11 days at a time. We only had enough food for about three days or so. We had uh, discussions as to who we would eat first. And I think we settled on Ben. Ben. Yeah, Ben. <laughs> I like to think that it's because they know that I'm the only one that would sacrifice myself for the team. And Ben also likes to eat a lot of fast food, so we thought that he might have some good flavoring there, too. It's one of the closest sort of tight-knit groups I've ever worked with. Because of that love that we feel for each other, it's genuine, and I think it helps us to you know, be even more cohesive as a team. Have a species be extinct and have a, a second chance to revive it is unheard of. We're going to basically see what we can find in the way of ivory bill signs or even the birds themselves. These birding biologists are looking for a ghost. The ivory billed woodpecker, a bird thought to have been extinct. Is it? In early 2004, along the Cache River in Arkansas, this video was taken from the seat of a canoe. Oh, what is it? Did you see it? It's flying away now. John Arvin is one of many bird experts who has analyzed the footage. When you can see the underwing, you see a large amount of white on the trailing edge separated by a black line of feathers down the center. These flight patterns appear to show that the bird is in fact an ivory bill woodpecker as opposed to a pileated woodpecker. This video multiple sightings and analyzed audio recordings were enough evidence by experts to declare that the ivory bill lives. 
It was an incredible frenzy. The whole ornithological community was just electrified by this. The bird had been thought extinct for 60 years. The Arkansas footage brought a lot of hope and it made other states like Texas get very excited because the chances of that bird being anywhere in its range are high. We're going to start in here. So John Arvin is leading a team of biologists, including John Fredland and Corinne Campbell. Navigate back. Their goal to find the ivory-billed woodpecker here in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> the search area covers part of the bird's historic range. Thousands of acres of bottomland hardwood forest habitat found in the Big Thicket National Preserve of Southeast Texas. Red bellied again. We're looking for any kind of woodpecker sign, either scaling, actually chipping away at the bark, looking for grubs for food, or cavities that it would make a home for the night. Yeah, but something really jacked that snag up. It's torn apart. We found some scaling that looks like woodpecker work. It's promising. It looks pretty pitted, but it is scaled all up and down. Take some footage of it. <laughs> By the end of the day, the team sees plenty of woodpeckers, but no ivory bill. Intense logging of bottomland hardwood forests in the late 1800s wiped out most of the ivory bill's habitat. The decline started when a lot of these large forests with large trees were cut down. The only film ever taken of an ivory bill was captured in 1935 in northeast Louisiana. The footage gives us some movement, some life to this bird, and most importantly, some voice. Massive sound equipment captured the only calls of the bird ever recorded. For the 30s, it was cutting edge. For these guys to have that kind of equipment back then was remarkable. In the search area, there are a total of eight species of woodpeckers, including the northern flicker, the red-bellied, and the red-headed. But the closest look-alike is the pileated. Extremely similar, this makes finding the ivory-billed woodpecker a bit of a challenge. Look at the back, and there's a white backpack on the ivory-billed, yet it's black on the pileated. And both birds are crow-sized, so when you see a crow-sized woodpecker with a white backpack, you should get excited. But most people are seeing the one with the black backpack, and that's the pileated. It's now the middle of the search season. There it is. I see it there. The team hopes some new technology will help spot an ivory bill. A cavity was found the last time we visited this area. We're putting a video camera up to see if we can see anything that looks like an ivory bill. Pull the slack out. This isn't just any camera. It has time-lapse capabilities and is motion sensitive. Any bird is most active at sunrise and sunset. Green light. And it's hopefully going to capture a bird coming in to roost for the night. What do you think? Looks pretty good to me. All right. At another location. This black gum right here will probably work for us. John is setting up an autonomous recording unit, which is programmed to record at sunrise and sunset. Round it go. I've been anticipating its arrival for quite some time. There. We have a longtime local resident who has reported activity, and we're going to deploy it and see if we can't pick up some sound. Let's ease his way through this mess. The team still has thousands of acres to search. They hope this new equipment will help improve their chances. We're covering the ground really well. We're getting into some areas that no one's ever been to probably before, yet we haven't seen evidence that would support Ivory Bill being here. There is one species of woodpecker that is not extinct, but it is endangered, the red cockaded woodpecker. Unlike the Ivory Bill, 
the red cockaded woodpecker had enough numbers at the time that it was put on the endangered species list and that we had something to work with, something to improve upon, something to increase. Biologists here have a huge nursery of sorts as they try to raise more. Coming up on the nest tree here. To check on the active tree cavities during the breeding season, the biologists use what's called a peeper cam. Might take a second. It's kind of a tough one to get in there. There we go. So I've got one male with a red crown patch. And then we have a female here that has no crown patch on her, which is good. It's 324, three chicks, 50 footer. Once new chicks hatch, the biologists climb up to those 40 to 50 foot high cavities. How's it going up there? You got them yet? To ban the birds, to give each new chick a name and a number. We try to do all the banding and the climbing within 15 to 30 minutes because we really don't want to interrupt the feeding schedule of these nestlings. There you go, Nancy. Thanks. OK. Let's see what we got here. OK, they look about nine days old. Got their eyes slightly open. You can see the feathers are starting to come out. It's going to be the um, dark blue of her mauve. We color band the birds in case we have a single male that uh, has his own territory, but he doesn't have a mate. And that way we can uh, track down the female and move her to that single male, and hopefully they will nest the following year. This is a good spot. For the search team, one way to try and capture a glimpse of the ivory bill is to sit and play some music, <laughs> bird music. Turn the volume, double knocks. We use playback to call ivory bills in. Um, the idea being the bird will hear its own species call and want to come and check it out. And while out alone with their cameras, they've seen their share of birds. I saw a affiliated during the playback, but he didn't seem to care at all about it. He just went away working on that snag over there. The snakes are out again. Can't say I like that. Lots of activity once it warms up in the swamp. An immense forest. Species too below. A team of biologists and one bird. The odds are stacked. Some cavities on that tree. But there is always hope. Waypoint name, CCC. After almost six months, the team tracked tens of thousands of acres. As for the sound recordings from the ARU, nothing. And the pictures from the remote camera. There's me around the tree. <laughs> it looks like you're posing for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It did capture some critters. There's a deer. I see a shadow. Is yeah. that what that is? That's the deer, yeah. Okay. But again, no ivory bill. No, you can't tell what it's doing. So after half a year in the big thicket, a ghost is still a ghost. There was nothing promising that we found out here to tell us that the bird is even in this state at all. But like any lost treasure, it might be hiding just out of sight. If there was a bird out there, I mean, there's still a huge chance it could be, and we didn't see it because it's, it's a pretty gigantic area we were covering, and it would have to rely on a whole lot of luck if it happened to be where we were. And all is not lost. This search brings new energy to the efforts to conserve and even restore these pristine bottomland hardwood forests of East Texas.